Okay, so welcome back into the shop. A quick reminder for those of you who have been with the channel for a while, uh, I do have two unlisted videos, uh, part one and part two, uh, with no voiceover. I know some of you guys really like that, and I want to make sure that I got you covered on that. So those will be linked in the description if you don't want to listen to the voiceover. Uh, they're there for you. First off, uh, this is the second part to this uh, two-part series on building these uh, stocks uh, for my granddad's 16-gauge. The first step is to drill out the holes uh, for the bolt that goes in that holds the stock to the receiver. So I'm going to do all that on my lathe. It makes it very easy. I used my drill press in the, the last uh, stock I built uh, for my 12-gauge, and it was a nightmare. So this new lathe is uh, making things a breeze. It's actually, I've got to drill three different size holes. So that first one holds the bolt and the washer, and I have to extend it here. I don't have enough uh, length in that Forstner bit, so I have to use a just do it by hand and side it and try to keep it as straight as possible and go to the depth I need. And then I'll come back in the other direction uh, with two different size holes, um, one of which is just enough clearance to keep the bolt, allow the bolt to go through it. And then the other one, there's actually a, a recessed nut that comes down from the receiver, or actually the trigger of the 16 gauge, and um, that needs to fit into a hole as well. So I'll drill the bigger hole first, obviously, and then come back and finish it off with the uh, smaller size hole. This Osage is really hard. Um, drilling into the end grain is a little bit tricky, and you have to get the speeds right. I heated up a few drill bits. You can see magically some blue tape appeared on that drill bit to mark my depth. Uh, I forgot to put that on there, so I added that. That will allow me, that will show me where to stop. So I back it off the lathe and then switch out bits. This is a much longer, I think this is a 3 8 um, either that or a 5 16 it's a much longer bit. And really at this point I'm crossing my fingers because this is where I finish off the holes and it should meet up to the hole I drilled from the other side um, if all goes well. And I remember on the last stock I made, it actually didn't work out. I got off at an angle and actually ended up shaping through the hole. Um, but this one, luckily, it all worked, it all came together. And these holes are actually at two different angles, slightly different. And you can kind of see through here and catch the light coming through. But they were tricky little holes to drill. And without the drill press, it, it really would have been a nightmare to do. So I'm glad I had it. The next step, obviously, we want to cut out the rough shape of the stock. I just trace the old one. It's the easiest way to do it. And I, I have a half-inch blade here. I'm a little 14-inch bandsaw, which is actually too wide of a blade for these curves, but I'm just making it work. Uh, a lot of times I'll use the big Oliver for this because I have a, a smaller blade for that. But changing out blades on the Oliver bandsaw is, a, is a, quite the procedure, so I didn't want to get into that. I love some sapwood on the top of this stock, hoping to, ha to have a nice little accent to it. I like the I like the idea of having that. Ended up shaping it off, so it didn't. It really made no sense at all, but uh, it was a good idea, I think. So with the shape cut, I need to I need to cut the the section of the stock that fits into the receiver. There's a recess in that, and a lot going on in there. I start by using a little palm router and just hogging out waste and then chiseling it. I've pre-laid everything out based off the previous stock. That's why it's so nice to have the old stock because you can just use it for, for all of your um, layout. Um, chiseling here, just working out those corners. Uh, obviously a round router bit can't cut a square corner, so I want to square those off. And then uh, there's a little mortise that drops in from the bottom. You'll see here in a second, um, and that is for part of the trigger. And we're going to do that on the drill press. You can see the comparison and how I still need to do that bottom slot slash mortise. Uh, and like I said, we'll do it on the drill press right here with a Forstner bit. It's a 3 8 the, the size that I needed was bigger than 3 8 didn't, It didn't dial into a perfect size of a drill bit. It was an odd size. Uh, so I just used the 3 8 and chiseled it out. I don't worry about blowing out here and going all the way through. It's split. It, this is going to be inside. You'll never see it. So I just go for it and let it, let it crack and then come back with a chisel and size it exactly how I need it. So now that I can actually fit the receiver uh, on to the stock um, I make sure everything lines up and is in there right and it is 
And now with that, I can trace the profile of that receiver around the stock uh, with a pencil, and that gives me the reference to shape to. There's also uh, the recoil pad here that goes on the back of the stock. I can use that as a reference point, point and trace it. And then at the bottom of the pistol grip, I'm not sure exactly what you call this little trim piece. I just want to use it as a point of reference so I trace the shape of it at the bottom of the pistol grip. Now that I have those three reference points, it makes it really easy to shape for the most part because I just work to those lines and I, and I can use those uh, references uh, to get a general idea of what the shape needs to be. Always start uh, roughing it out. I mean, a draw knife is a great tool to do rough work. If you're uh, good with it, you can do really fine work as well if you have the control. Um, I'm finding it difficult here because this, Os you know, the Osage is a hardwood and it's cutting fine, but it wants to split in some areas. Um, so I, I don't do a whole lot of roughing out uh, with the draw knife. I end up swapping it out for um, a low angle spoke shave or a wooden spoke shave, which is set for a heavy cut. And that's what I'm doing right now. So yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot more control, a lot less tear out, and then obviously I've got my um, good spoke shaves here that are more for a fine cut and have zero to no tear out if they're tuned properly. So I continue uh, fitting it, and when I get close, I use a knife to mark it because that's way more accurate than pencil. It gives me a, a little bit more accurate of a line to work to. And I just keep working it. You can see that layout at the bottom of the pistol grip, kind of work into that. Uh, all in all, this process probably took three hours. Uh, I'm sitting here and shaping. My rasp really come in handy to do tight curves where you can't get your spoke shave in and cut. I have two different rasps, a coarse and a fine, and um, they work really well to shape with. Even on the Osage, um, they handle it pretty good, so I was happy about that. And you can see the comparison as I work, kind of work that pistol grip area of the stock. So now I'm working a little bit on the back end of the, uh, the butt stock. I start with a scrub plane. Again, that's going to take a heavy cut and take a lot of waste off. And then I work down to a block plane here. Uh, taking finer cuts, more control, less tear out. Uh, you can tune it up with a sharper blade and, and a closed throat so you have more support on your wood fibers. Uh, I'm still going to get some tear out, but uh, much more, much better work of it than a scrub plane. With that shape, I want to work on kind of the fine details of the pistol grip. And this is the really fun part. I, I get to get the gouges out and, and really show off what hand, what something done by hand can do as opposed to a machine. I, I can keep crisp lines in certain areas. Um, so I start with a really small gouge and here I've got a bigger gouge that kind of fits that scoop a little bit better. And just continuing uh, on one side, and then once you have one side where, the way you want it to look, you can flip it and, and kind of match it and side it. Uh, and you can see how that's coming together. Here, uh, it, there's actually a little bit of a scoop out in that pistol grip. Um, and this is, mat again, matching the other stock. And what I'm doing is just getting a feel with my hands. How do I want this to feel? Uh, mark it with pencil so I know kind of where I can see where I'm taking material off, basically. So it helps me gauge where I'm moving the material off the wood uh, and I'll just again shape it uh, with the rasp and you know get a feel for how it feels in my hand I want it to be comfortable um, it's just a slow process but for me I love this organic style of shaping things I think it's so much fun um, that's why I like to do um, these stocks you know I just enjoy the shaping process and you know, you always want to cite it and make sure that both sides are the same because if you're looking down on the stock and one is different than the other, it, that drives me crazy. I want it to be even. I want it to look the same. So if you pay attention here, you're about to see uh, a mistake where I actually run my chisel into the metal part of my vise. Um, happens every once in a while. Uh, 
that's dull. Right into the vice, dude. Switch out chisels. Go with my Swedish chisel. So, yeah, I gotta swap out chisels. Um, I actually end up going with a wider chisel. I like working with wider chisels. These are all, my wider ones are always at a lower angle bevel. Um, and I just, I don't know, I think they're, they're a little bit more control there. So this is the V chisel I was telling you about. Just kind of working that um, drop off down into the pistol grip. And this will make more sense as we get further into the carving because we're going to take a lot of that material to the left off. Um, but I'm going to do that after I shape this curve in on the pistol grip. So here's where I'm going to start taking that material off. It starts with a block plane. The trick here is you can't get the block plane all the way into that pistol grip. It's going to hit um, the wood and then it's going to stop. So you can't make the cut all the way. So I work from the back, kind of tapering it up to that pistol grip and then come with a chisel and chisel away the rest of that waste. And I was fortunate that the grain was working in my advantage. A lot of times when you do this technique, if you don't have uh, good grain, you're just it's just not going to work because you got unsupported fibers. You're just cutting them away and it, if the grain's running the wrong way it'll just split the fibers as opposed to cutting them. You're basically just using a chisel as if it's a hand plane. Just trying to take long even cuts. And the best I can with a spoke shave to clean up and straighten those cuts out, try to level them out. Like I said you can only go so far and then you gotta come in with the chisel and finish it off. And I want a nice crisp transition uh, from that point I'm chiseling to the pistol grip. I don't want that to be uh, sloppy or, or all, I guess, washed out. I want it to be a crisp stop going both ways, almost like there's a line there. And those little details are what you can do with hand tools. If you were just sanding this or grinding it, it's so hard to control. You can't add those little details in where you have these um, crisp edges and nice transitions. So as I was talking about earlier, the transition, this is this is kind of me fine-tuning it uh, with a chisel. Just kind of trying to, I, honestly, I was trying to put a little bit of a curve to the transition up, to the, up towards the top of the stock on both sides, trying to make them similar and the same. Um, you're obviously not going to get it perfect, and that's what's great about hand tool work as well. Is it's never going to be perfect. You can always tell it's done by hand, but you want to do the best that you you can do with it. A little sandpaper. I, I I do sand at the end of this. Um, obviously, you got to get the tool marks out, but you want to be careful with the sandpaper not to uh, ruin those transitions. There's my dog Mayor, always in the way. Um, he doesn't move. He sleeps a lot. So this little pump-up sander is a great tool. There's actually air in that sanding uh, bladder there, and it has a little give to it, and it'll follow the profile. And I, have, I think I have a 120 or 220 on here. And I, I can sand off all the tool marks, clear out any tear out, um, works really well. And also put the, the recoil pad on there and just sand it flush because it's a, it, it's a little bit bigger. So a coat of shellac goes on it. That is not the traditional finish for gun stocks. I'm using the shellac because I want to get right into checkering. And uh, it's a quick, quick finish to dry and it's de-waxed so I can put oil over this after I checker. So I'll throw a couple coats of de-wax shellac on, and then I'm going to knock through this checkering pretty quick because it's very repetitive. You saw it in the forend. Um, so I'm sure you guys don't want to sit there and watch every single detail of the checkering. The first thing to do is lay out. I'm copying the pattern of the old stock. I don't have a lot of knowledge of checkering patterns. Like, like I sh mentioned in the first video, this is my first stock to ever checker. I don't know a lot about checkering. It's very new to me. I'm trying to learn it right now, so I would not call myself uh, that great at it. Although on this run, I do feel like I gained a better understanding of the tools, the sounds they're making, how they work. I also, um, many people commented and suggested to get a visor, magnifying visor, which was a great idea. I actually had kind of thought about that, but didn't, I don't know, there's part of you that thinks 
you're not your eyes are good enough you don't need that but yeah it helped a ton i got one and it really helps keep you on track so i didn't explain this but i cut the border first and now i'm just going back and cutting these series of lines it's 24 lines per inch and it's yeah it's just really repetitive um so the main thing about this is just staying focused uh, really trying to stay on top of it and not lose your focus and get your lines off because once you get your lines off it's really hard to get back on I'm coming back now in the opposite direction so here I'm starting to form the diamonds that you're gonna make when you check her uh, so you basically make the lines going one way and the lines going the other way um, and then you have to deepen them out and point them so you can see I got the visor on super helpful there's also a cradle you can buy for these stocks that would probably help out I've just been being creative and chucking it up on my lathe, but it's not the best way to hold the workpiece. Uh, here I am finishing up the the uh, the checkering pattern with a with a border. There's a little beading tool that will beat around it, uh, and that again too is is tricky. I haven't been able to make that bead exactly how I want it. It doesn't go quite deep enough, and I think part of that might be that this Osage is just so hard that you it's hard for these tools to work it down like it needs to be done, but. Uh, for the most part, I was pretty happy with it. I always have this piece to look back on. You know, this is going to be mine. So um, hopefully in three or four years, I'm a lot better at it. And I can compare it and say, oh, that's what it looked like when I started. <clears throat> All right, so here it is, the completed uh, Ithaca Model 37 16 gauge uh, we've done the buttstock obviously with all the checkering you can see already starting to oxidize to this pretty uh, rust color it's got a ways to go still but we'll get there and then this one's obviously a little bit behind a little more yellow in it um, just really really cool looking I think it's by far my favorite I'm pretty happy with how that checkering came out and just the you know as I was telling you about those crisp trans transitions you get um, it has a real nice feel in the hand, um, and just an all-around really pretty looking stock, really pretty looking piece of wood. I uh, had a blast making this. There is so much time in building this, um, and it really is a labor of love. And the fact that it was uh, my granddad's makes it even cooler, uh, because this is mine now, and I'm going to hold on to it. Uh, and this uh, Osage will likely outlast uh, the gun. If you didn't get a chance to see it, this is was also my granddad's. This is the first one I ever made. There's no checking in this one, checkering in this one, but it's a beautiful piece of Texas walnut on there, um, and this is a 12 gauge. Um, so these are both mine. They were both my granddad's, and I restocked both of them. So if you're interested and you enjoyed that one, go check out this one. I uh, like I mentioned, I did this on the drill press, and we had a little bit of an error in there. I had to fill it with black epoxy, uh, but that's what happens. You live and learn. Um, and that's what I'm learning on the checkering. I'm learning how to do it, and I'm not great at it, but I'm getting better at it. So as always, appreciate you guys tuning in. Y'all are awesome. Y'all have been very supportive. I hope you've enjoyed the, the voiceover content. And remember, I'm not going to leave you hanging if you don't like it. I'm going to put the videos uh, unlisted in the description so you can still check it out. have some exciting content in the works uh, and a possible really big project. I haven't decided if I'm going to pull the trigger on it yet. Um, but I'll give you a little hint of what it is. It involves... Uh, something silver that you would sleep in so uh, it's a restoration um, and it's something uh, that I'm knocking around in my head I think I'm gonna do it I'm pretty excited about it um, like I said thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time